All right, guys. Let's focus up. The SAQ one was due yesterday. If you haven't turned them in, make sure that you do so. Let me know and remind, please. Otherwise, they will remain ungraded. Yes, ma'am. So, like, what if you submitted it to custom planning, but I submitted it on the That's okay. Just let me know anyway. And SAQ number two will be due tonight. I'll be grading them tomorrow morning. As long as you submit it before then, you should be good. You have upcoming assignments. MCQ practice would be on Sunday. That's 55 multiple choice questions. One of those, take one of those exams. Try to time yourself 55 minutes. And then on Monday and Tuesday, you have the rest of your notes that are going to be required that are going to be due. Some of you are lagging behind and your grades don't look so good, especially for the progress report. You should be taking some time every day for studying for your AP World History class. That means either looking at notes, watching videos and taking notes on them, or doing these practice assignments that I gave you is an opportunity. And some of you are letting it slip away. Um, this was meant to while you're studying to also boost your grades a little bit. But for a lot of you, this is having an opposite effects on your, on your grade because you're not keeping up with your assignments. It's gonna snowball on you next week. You got those two notes and you also have the big essays that are due, the DBQ and the LEQ. And if you haven't finished the rest of the assignments that were assigned earlier, then it's gonna become too overwhelming for you. So try to keep up with your stuff, guys. Um, This is an opportunity that some of you are letting slip by. A lot of you know your stuff. It's just a matter of reviewing your stuff and a matter of practicing how to do them. Um, this is college credit, guys. In three years from now, the same time this year, you guys are going to be seniors. Your grades are not going to matter anymore. Your GPA is not going to matter. Ranking is already done. The only thing that will matter is what did you do to help yourself in college? What did you do to save yourself some time and save yourself some money and save your parents some time and money as well? And in other campuses, AP exams are worth $140 for the opportunity to take the exam at Achieve. It's free. Some of you are letting this opportunity slip away. So make sure you try to uh, keep focused and stay organized. To give you another incentive, I know I'm giving you a lot, but to give you another incentive to study and do these exams, if everything is done by May 10th, when everything is due, May 10th, if you have all nine assignments finished, I'll give you 100 on the final exam. You still have to show up. It's 100. It's not an exemption. An exemption doesn't do anything for your grade. It doesn't boost it up. It doesn't make it lower. 100 does. It will boost it up. It is 25% of your semester grade. So if you have everything done by May 10th, then I'll give you that um, incentive. But make sure you try to, to get everything done, please. Wait, like everything done, like all the things you assigned? Before nine, you yes, done? all those nine assignments, I need them turned in by May 10th. All right, let's get started. Unit 5, we're starting a new, un uh, new time period today. Unit 5 is between 1750 and 1900. So typically, Unit 5 is about the 1800s or the 19th century. At the same time, Unit 5 is going on, so does Unit 6. Unit 6 and Unit 5 are occurring concurrently from one another. To give you context, because again, you need to provide contextualization on your essay. So you need to talk about the stuff that happened before. So in Unit 3 and Unit 4, we saw the expansion of land base and, and maritime empires. We saw monarchs consolidating and centralizing power within themselves. We saw Europeans achieve trans-oceanic travel and establish the Atlantic Exchange. We saw the Colombian Exchange, the interaction between Europeans, Europe, um, Africans, and indigenous people that caused societal and economic changes in the new world. That brings us to Unit 5. In Unit 5, the biggest development here is revolution, seismic changes. They can be political revolutions like the American and the French Revolution, but they can also be economic revolutions like the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> the first thing we need to talk about is the ideological and intellectual causes of these revolutions. There's two. First, 
an intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment started in Europe, and the ideas that, uh, that were birthed by the Enlightenment will spread throughout the world, and it will cause seismic changes wherever it spread. The Enlightenment integrated empiricism. Empiricism comes from science. It is the use of evidence and reason. But instead of applying evidence and reason to scientific thought, the Enlightenment philosophers have applied it to humanity. They applied it to society and government, to society and politics. And they began to challenge and rethink the way things are. They began to challenge religious institutions. They began to challenge political institutions and the traditional power and religious structures of the world. And these ideas are going to cause revolution, especially here in the Atlantic world. All right. So what kind of ideas? Democratic ideas like natural rights or individual rights. These are human rights. These are rights that you have not because you deserve them. It's rights that you have because you're a human being. These are fundamental rights that must be protected, that should not be taken away even by the government, which is contrary to what people believed back then, where you have these governments with absolute power, with absolute monarchy that can do whatever they want to the people that they rule. Enlightenment philosophers say, no, you have fundamental human rights that nobody should be able to take away from you. John Locke says, you got life, you got liberty, and you got property. These are three rights that should be protected that not even the government should be able to take away from you, which is a challenge to the traditional political order of the world back then. Next. We have liberty and equality, freedom and universal equality. Everybody was born equal, which again is a challenge to pe how people thought back then, where people were born that have more privilege than others. There's people born to rule and there are people born to be ruled. But the Enlightenment philosopher said, no, everybody was born equal, universal equality. Next, social contract. The idea that the government has an obligation to you. The idea that we surrender our freedoms to a government. We allow our government to take away some of our less essential freedoms, like our freedom to murder, our freedom to rape. We allow them to make rules. We allow them to make laws. But they have an obligation towards us. What's that obligation? To protect your natural rights, your fundamental freedoms, your, your life, your liberty, and your property. The government has an obligation towards you. It's a contract. It's not a one-way street. We surrender some of our non-essential freedoms for the protection of our basic human rights, life, liberty, and property. And if the government is not fulfilling its end of the bargain, if the government is not fulfilling that obligation, what can the people do under social contract theory? We can change. We can destroy that government. Social contract goes both ways. This is what's going to inspire a lot of revolutionary movements during this time period. And then lastly, we have the idea of popular sovereignty, that whatever authority, whatever power government has, popular means people, sovereignty means power. It comes from the people that it rules. It comes from the consent of the governed. Joe, pa Joe Biden's a very powerful man, but that power comes from you. When you elected him to office, you gave him that power. Government's power and government's authority comes from the people below. It comes from the bottom up, which is a challenge to the way people thought back then. People thought that where does power come from? It comes from a divine source, the divine rights of kings. It comes from the top to the bottom. But Lyman philosophers flip that around. It comes from the people below. It comes from the consent of the governed. We elect representatives and we give them power to rule over us, but that power comes from us. We can give it to them. We can also take it away. So these ideas will propel revolutions all throughout the world. Another intellectual foundation of these revolutions is the idea of nationalism. Here's a simple definition in case you're asked to define these on your FRQs. You should define them anyway. Nationalism is loyalty towards one's people group. Loyalty towards one's people group. What unites that people group can be different. It could be a common culture. It could be a common language. It could be a common religion. It could be a common ethnicity. But it's loyalty towards people that share the same national identity as you do. If you're feeling patriotic, it's because you're feeling loyalty to Americans, to the people in this country. That's nationalism. Nationalism is loyalty to your people group. Whatever binds you together. That could be language, that could be a common ethnicity, that could be a common culture. 
And what does nationalism, this intense feeling of nationalism, tend to foster? The desire for these people group to have their own what? Their own nation state, their own country, to be able to rule themselves as a common people. Nationalism is going to inspire many of the revolutions that will take place during this time period as well. A common identity. All right. Enlightenment will cause many reform movements to take place. What does reform mean? Change. So many people are going to call for changes based on enlightenment ideals, like political changes, political reform. When we say politics, it means government. Ideas like popular sovereignty increase the calls for new versions of government, new types of government, new forms of government. What was the traditional form of government before the Enlightenment took place? Monarchy. What kind of monarchy? Absolute monarchy. Absolute monarchy. You have kings, czars, sultans with absolute power. Well, the Enlightenment is going to question that. Popular sovereignty, natural rights. So this is going to cause calls for changes in government. In Europe, that's going to mean that one by one, many of these monarchies in Europe are going to stay monarchies, but they're going to become limited monarchies, what they called constitutional monarchies, where you have a king, you have a monarch, but his power is what? Limited. Is limited. It's limited by a constitution. Oftentimes, that involves an elected body of people that rule side by side with the king, where you have people electing representatives. In England, they call this elected body what? Parliament. In the United States, we call it Congress, but an elected body of people. We elect them, popular sovereignty. We give them the power, and the power of the king is limited. Today, technically, England still has a constitutional monarchy because they still have a king. But the king's power in England today is very, very limited. Most of the power belongs to this elected body. One by one, the monarchies of Europe will transform because of these enlightenment ideas spreading throughout the world. They will transform into limited constitutional monarchies. In the New World, as many of these revolutions will give birth to independent nations in the New World, independent countries in the New World, they're not going to go with monarchies. Instead, they're going to form a different type of government. What kind of government? What is a government without a king called? Republics. Republican governments are going to be created. Who was the first colony to establish a Republican government after their revolution? Sorry? Was the first in the New World? We did. We created the American Republic, right? A, a country, a government without a king. So, revolutions in the colonies will give birth to Republican governments. Republican governments here in the United States, Republican government in Haiti, and Republican governments in Latin America, governments without kings. Another reform movement that was inspired by the Enlightenment was abolitionism. The concepts that the Enlightenment thought, like universal equality, that everybody was born the same, nobody's born above everybody else, and natural rights, basic human rights, made people question which institutions. Um, what does ab abolitionism mean? From the word abolish, what are they trying to abolish? Slavery and serfdom. They're trying to get rid of the institutions, the old-time institutions of slavery and serfdom, inspired by the concepts of equality, inspired by the concepts of human basic human rights. There's going to be movements that are working against slavery and against serfdom. And they're going to yield results. By the 1800s, one by one, many of the European states and many of these newly independent states in the New World are going to get rid of the slave trade. And then later on, they're going to get rid of slavery altogether. Some earlier than others. The United States is one of the latest ones. We got rid of it in 1865. But many of our neighbors in Latin America had got rid of it in the early 1800s. Thanks to the work of this abolitionist inspired by the Enlightenment. Another reform movement. Oh, and then in 1861, we have Tsar Alexander II. If he's a Tsar, where does he rule? In the Russian Empire, he will free 20 million serfs in Russia. As a result, again, of the work of these abolitionists that were inspired by the ideals of the Enlightenment. 
another reform movement that will be inspired by the Enlightenment is feminism. Feminism, again, using the concepts of universal equality, not just between races, but between genders as well. Basic human rights that were often denied women, feminists are going to challenge the patriarchal structure of the world. What has been a continuity is how the world treats women in almost all societies, second to men. So feminism will fight against that and will try to um, fork for human uh, basic women's rights and the right to vote. The thing that you need to remember about these feminist movements in the 1800s is they're really not going to go very far. They're not going to be able to achieve what they want to achieve in the 1800s. When are they going to get what they want? In the 20th century, in the 1900s, where they, many of the states gave them the right to vote, gave them gender equality as well. All right, these are two documents that you need to remember that were foundations of the feminist movement. So in case you see them on your multiple choice, recognize them as feminist documents inspired by the Enlightenment, the vindication of the rights of women, and during the French Revolution, the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen, which was a copy of the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen. All right, where did the Seneca Falls Convention take place? New York, here in the United States, it is a convention of women. The first time the women's rights movement in the United States got organized. So these are all feminist movement. All right. Explain the causes and effects of various revolutions from period of 1750 and 1900. We already talked about two. The ideas of the Enlightenment. Ideas like popular sovereignty, equality. These are things that will inspire revolutions in the Atlantic world. I keep mentioning the Atlantic world. I realize some of you may not know what that means. The Atlantic world will be Europe and the Americas. Europe and America. There's going to, have, there's going to be revolutions there inspired by the ideals of the Enlightenment. That's why in a lot of these revolutions, like the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Latin American Revolution, what kind of people usually led these revolutions? The educated, the intellectuals, those that have learned these ideals, those that have studied enlightenment principles, they're the ones that are usually leading these revolutions. Our founding fathers, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, these are students of the enlightenment. The Creoles in Latin America also studied the enlightenment. Those French revolutionaries that started the French Revolution studied the enlightenment. They were inspired by these ideas. Next, rising nationalism, particularly in the New World. As the colonists in the New World begin to think of themselves as a separate people group, as the people in the 13 colonies stop thinking of themselves as British subjects and start thinking of themselves as Americans, now you have the desire for your own nation state. The Creoles in Latin America stop thinking of themselves as Spanish or Portuguese and start thinking of themselves as a separate people group, a separate national identity. And when you start feeling nationalism, you start feeling the desire for your own what? Nation state, for your own country. So the people of the colonists, so this is what you can put on your FRQs, the people of the colonies began to think of themselves as separate from their mother country, having a separate identity, as being quote unquote American instead of being British, or instead of being Spanish, instead of being Portuguese giving birth to a desire for their own countries, for their own independent states. So those are the two. Next, discontent with monarchical rule, with monarchies rule and imperial rule. United States in 1776, who will start the American Revolution. And what are some of the reasons for that? All the reasons we talked about in eighth grade. Taxation without representation, lack of representation in the British government. Main complaint, especially in the colonies, is mercantilistic policies where you have the British government and all these mother countries controlling the trade in the colonies, preventing us from um, buying and selling to whoever we want to buy and sell to, awarding monopolies to companies that we may not want. Like we were supposed to buy from the British East India Company and we had no choice in the matter. So mercantilistic policies, government intrusion and intervention in trade when it comes to the econ economy of the new world, that's one of the major complaints. France, in France, they're gonna start the French Revolution, 1789. Partly inspired by our revolution, the French will also rebel against their king, and against their monarch. This was caused by massive and entrenched 
inequality in France, where you have the haves and the have-nots, the aristocrats and the commoners, deeply, deeply divided. And whenever France gets into financial trouble, usually the burden of fixing that financial trouble doesn't fall on the aristocrats that have the money, doesn't fall on the king, but on the commoners of France. And finally, they got sick and tired of that, those social economic inequalities that existed in France that they decided to rebel and overthrow their king. They even beheaded him. So they were so tired of absolute monarchy. They were tired of social injustice. They were inspired by the Enlightenment as well. At the same time, chaos is brewing in France during the French Revolution. Their most profitable colony in the New World, Haiti, is also experiencing their own revolution, partly inspired by the revolution that's taking place in France, where everybody's talking about equality, where everybody's talking about um, um, democracy. Who was inspired in Haiti? Who led this revolution? Unlike the other revolutions that we're going to talk about today, who led the revolution in Haiti? Slaves. African slaves. Those were the people that were living in Haiti. Slaves that were brought over to the sugar plantations of Haiti that were oppressed under this institution of slavery, inspired by the ideals of the French Revolution, and taking advantage of the chaos that's happening in France, they started their own slave rebellion. Did they win? Yes, they were able to overthrow French rule in Haiti. <laughs> All right, so favorite question on your exam. These two are directly related to one another. If it wasn't for the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution probably would have never been successful. The French would have been able to dedicate most of their forces in stopping the Haitian Rebellion if it wasn't for the fact that they were dealing with the French Revolution back at home. So they're related to one another. Next, we have revolutions in Latin America, in the Portuguese and the Spanish colonies in Mexico and South America. So Latin American revolutions. What do they not like? They don't like absolute monarchies. They don't like mercantilistic policies, just like us, just like the 13 colonies. We didn't like it that the mother country controlled our trade, told us who to buy from. And in Latin America, like we talked about yesterday, which group of people led many of these revolutions? Creoles, and they were unsatisfied with the way they were treated compared to the way the peninsulares were treated by the Spanish and Portuguese crown. Any questions? Let's talk about the effects. You need to know some documents that came out of these revolutions. So what's the most important document in the American Revolution? 1776, what is it called? The Declaration of Independence. Who wrote it? Thomas Jefferson. And all of this is chock full of enlightenment ideas, popular sovereignty, natural rights. They're all embedded in it. We hold these truths to be self evident All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All of these come from the enlightenment. Actually, all three of these, just to make it simple, are based on enlightenment ideals. The justification for revolution, the justification for overthrowing monarchy is embedded by Enlightenment ideals. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen, feminists will copy that and they will create their own document called the Declaration of Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. It outlines basic human rights, basic human rights, again, from the Enlightenment. In the Latin American revolutions, we have one document that you all need to remember, a letter from Jamaica. Who wrote it? Simon Bolivar, very good, Simon Bolivar. The liberator, the guy who was responsible for many of the military victories in South America that led to independence for many of these states. What did he write about? He told the South Americans to declare independence. He told the South Americans to form their own republics, to establish republics based on enlightenment principles. He also advocated for a united South America. If you all remember, he didn't get that. All right, number two, the establishment of new governments. What type of governments, again, were established in the New World? Republics. Even the French across the ocean established the French Republic, a government without a monarch. And all these newly independent states are also going to establish republics. All right, number three, a huge development during this time period. In the previous time periods, you have these big empires that are multicultural, multi-ethnic empires that were formed. But 
little by little, that's going to go away. And the way we organize countries as a result of nationalism today, the way we create states is based on a common national identity. Gone are the days of multi-ethnic, multicultural empires. Their days are numbered. What's going to take place is you're going to have countries being formed because the people of those countries share a common identity, whether that's religion, whether that's ethnicity, whether that's culture or a combination of all of those. That's the way that countries are going to be organized from now on. All right. <laughs> now, nationalism, this feeling of loyalty towards your people group, can cause division. It's a problem for multicultural and multi-ethnic empires, but it can also cause unification. So let's talk about division first. In parts of the world, many people who will experience nationalism, who will experience a sense of commonality with, other, with, with the people around them, will try to create their own independent states. They will try to break away from empires. We talked about examples of this. In the United States, nationalism was a big part of our American revolution. Latin American revolutions, nationalism is a big part of those revolutions as well. But sometimes on your LEQs, they're going to ask you for some revolutions that took place outside of the New World. So here's one. In New Zealand, a colony of which country? Britain? The people, which what are the indigenous people they're called? The Maori, the Maori people, will also experience their own nationalism. They will start to identify with one another, and that nationalism will drive them to want their own nation, to want their own country free of British rule. And they're going to rebel against the British. Is that going to be successful? Not really. No. All right, in Puerto Rico... Lola Rodriguez de Tio, a poet in Puerto Rico, will also inspire Puerto Rican nationalism. And the Puerto Ricans, through her poetry, are going to be inspired to try to rebel against Spain. Again, just like in the Maori's case, they're not going to be successful in that. They're going to be under Spanish rule, unlike the rest of Latin America, until the end of the um, 19th century. Another example would be here in Asia. Which people group in Asia decided to want their own independence in the 1800s? The Philippines. The Philippines wanted to, their own independence from who? From Spain. They were led by intellectuals. Anybody remember what they were called? There were Creoles and Mestizos from the Philippines that studied in Europe and they learned about the Enlightenment and they began to feel nationalism. That's why they decided to rebel against Spain. What is it called? They, were, they started writing things, right? To manipulate people's opinions. So what do you call publications or art? that propaganda. propaganda. It's called the propaganda movement in the Philippines. So you have many examples outside of Europe, outside of the New World, where nationalism drove revolutions. In the Ottoman Empire... The slow decline of the Ottoman Empire will also be brought about by nationalism as well, as you have many groups in the Ottoman Empire wanting their own country, feeling nationalism. Um, particularly, the Christians over here in the Balkans, they will feel separated from the rest of the Ottoman Empire, which is primarily Muslim, and they will try and achieve their own independent states. And one by one, the Ottoman Empire is going to lose territories due to nationalism as many of the people groups inside of the empire desired their own country. The Ottomans tried to impose Ottomanism. Anybody remember what Ottomanism is? They try to impose a what in their empire? Uh, it's national identity, a common national identity. They realized that their empire is in trouble because of the different uh, ethnic and religious and cultural identities within their empire. So what they try to do is, create this one Ottoman Empire, one, I'm sorry, this common Ottoman identity throughout their empire. Did it work? Yeah. Not really. It further alienated the different people groups of the Ottoman Empire. Didn't really work. But nationalism, just as much as it is a force of division and it causes empires to fall, it could be a force of unification as people that share the same identity, that share the same national identity, that may be a part of different states, 
begin to desire a unification of those states and one country that unites all of their people. I gave you two examples of that. What are they? Germany and Italy. Germany and Italy. If you look at Europe, look how ugly that is in Central Europe, right? No Germany. It's a collection of independent Germanic states. No Italy, a collection of independent Italian kingdoms. But because of nationalism, the Italian peoples and the German peoples wanted their own country, a united Germany and a united Italy. And that's what they're going to achieve in the 1870s. So we are 100 years older than the German state and then the Italian state. We were created in 1776. They will be created in the 1870s. Anybody remember who was the statesman that was instrumental in uniting Germany? Otto von Bismarck. He started two wars, one with Austria, their German rival state, and one with France to promote German nationalism that ultimately led to the unification of Germany into one powerful state. And almost overnight, you got a very powerful state born in the middle of Europe. Then you also have Italian unification. Let's go to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is an economic revolution. It will transform the world forever. Which country, which state began the Industrial Revolution? Britain, England began the Industrial Revolution. You need to know how. The reason, the cause is geographic and environmental factors. Geography was the reason that Britain industrialized first. First, Britain is an island state. It has access to waterways, it has a lot of rivers, it has access to the Atlantic Ocean. It enabled Britain to deliver and transport goods easier and more cost effective than any other country. Next, in England, they had resources that were necessary for industrialization, like coal, iron, are, plenty, are plentiful in, in um, England. Then you have urbanization. The cities of Europe had large populations. Why do you need that? for workers so you have cities in Europe that have large populations where you can put your factory in so you can take advantage of those populations as your workforce next agricultural productivity improved during this time you need to feed these workers somehow so that's another factor next you need to have resources that cannot be found in your own country and Britain had access to those resources that may not be in Britain why? Because the British had what? They had colonies. And because of those colonies, the Atlantic trade and all that, many British people had a lot of money to spare. They had capital that they can then use to invest in factories, invest in businesses, invest in industry. All these factors combined made England the first industrial state of the world, starting the Industrial Revolution. Another thing that developed during this time that the English developed is a new production method. I know we didn't talk about this a lot, but it might pop up on your exam. So listen carefully. It's called the factory system. This is a new method of production. All it does is the steps of producing a product is concentrated in one location, usually a factory. So all the steps of production concentrated in one building in one location, a factory. That was made possible by the steam engine. Next. The use of machines for mass production. Not things made by hand, but the use of machines. And then finally, dividing labor into simplified tasks, into specialized tasks, where you have a laborer not having to be responsible for all the steps of the production process. You give him one job, and then the other guy gets another job, a division of labor. This greatly improved production. It's going to make Britain the main manufacturer of the world. This new method of production will increase manufacturing. It will increase production. And Britain will be able to outpace everybody else because of these new methods of production. All right. Because of the Industrial Revolution, we're going to get a shift in the share of manufacturing. In the previous units, the goods that are manufactured and traded throughout the world where did most of them come from? Most of them come from Asia. 
So if you, if this is all the world's manufactured goods, all the goods that are produced and then bought and sold in the exchange networks that we talked about, most of those goods are manufactured from Asia, from India, from China, from the Muslim states in the Middle East. They were the main manufacturers of the world. What's going to be the seismic shift in the Industrial Revolution? That pie is going to be different. The share of the world's manufacturing will increasingly belong to who? To Europe. It's not that the Asians are not going to be able to produce as much as they used to. They're still producing a lot. It's just they're, they're going to be outpaced by the Europeans. The Europeans are going to be able to mass produce so much because of the Industrial Revolution. So the share of manufacturing will increasingly belong to Europe, and the share of manufacturing for Asians are going to decline, which also signals a shift in power and wealth towards Europe. In Unit 3 and Unit 4, we get the Europeans slowly rising up, Transoceanic travel, but they're not on top of the world yet. The Asians are still on top of the world, but the Industrial Revolution is what's going to propel them to be on top of the world. Manufacturing, outpacing everybody else. So, for example, when it comes to textile production, India and Egypt used to be the states that produced the most clothing, which were valuable at the time. But then the British, with their new methods of production, are going to outpace them and they're going to be able to um, sell these products at a much cheaper rate because they're mass produced. All right. New technologies in transportation and communications. During this time, there's three that you need to remember. The railroads, trains, you got the telegraph for communication, Morse code and all that, and steamships that will be able to deliver goods from, from place to place. So this will greatly improve trade, it will greatly improve communication and travel and cultural exchange as well. Just like what we talked about in our last unit, in Unit 9, we talked about improvements in transportation that cause globalization. We talked about airlines or air travel. We talked about automobiles. We talked about the internet and cell phones. This is the new technologies that were introduced in the 1800s that facilitated trade and travel. All right. The Industrial Revolution took place in two phases. You need to know... Um, the characteristics of those two phases. Time period for the first Industrial Revolution started when this time period started, about 1750. And it's going to last until about 1830. Which state? England. England. Very good. Britain. Britain was the only state that industrialized during this time period. What was the source of energy for many of the British factories? Coal. The burning of coal. Alongside coal is the use of what machine of production? Steam engine. The burning of coal powered the steam engine. What was the main industry that the British focused on in the first stage of the Industrial Revolution? Textiles, clothing, whoever said that. Textiles. Then we shift towards the second phase where new countries are going to join um, Britain in industrialization. The time period would be from 1870, so when Germany formed, to about the 1900s to the 20th century. We're still going to have some states industrializing. Who joined Britain? In the United States? Germany, France, Belgium, Russia. Which non-Western, non-white state joined the Industrial Age? Japan as well. Very good. Alongside coal... Coal is still going to be used as a source of energy. What other sources of energy were used in the second stage? Oil or petroleum? And what else? Okay. Thomas Edison. Uh, electricity. electricity. Which was a fundamental thing, allowing people to work through the night. And a new engine of production is also introduced during this time, a smaller, more efficient engine. It's in your cars. The internal combustion engine, the internal combustion engine. New industries will join the textile industry in the second phase of, of the Industrial Revolution. Like the thing that you memorized in eighth grade, during this time, the Bessemer process was able to produce what? Steel. Steel was made easier through the Bessemer process. Vulcanization allowed for the production of what? Vulcanize. What does that mean? <laughs> So a new industry that was born during this time is chemical engineering. 
like the Bessemer process, rubber and synthetic dyes were being produced as well during this time. So new industries were developed at this time. All right, we'll end there. How much time we got? All right, we don't have a lot of time left, so... Uh. <laughs> Mia, pick one to not answer. One, two, or three. All right, we're not doing two. One and three. <laughs>